Well, guess what? Blue Origin, the company owned by Jeff Bezos, has sent dinosaur bones to outer space. Can you believe it? Why? Well, it's all part of their Dream Big initiative to inspire people, especially students, to reach for the stars. On April 14, 2021, they launched almost 200 pieces of dinosaur bones into space using their new Shepard rocket. These bones are super old, like between 66 million and 70 million years old. They were fragments from a dinosaur called a Dromaeosaurus, which was part of a raptor family. It was kind of like a bird, but also a fierce hunter. It was about 7 feet long and had sharp claws on its feet. These guys were really good at hunting and slicing into their prey, do you think? Can you imagine how cool it would be to see a real dinosaur like that? The bones were carefully packed into a small container that was about 4 inches long. Then, on April 14th, they launched into space on a test flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket. The rocket went 65 miles above the ground, which is a little above the point where Earth ends and space begins. The dinosaur bones were in space for about 10 minutes and 10 seconds. Alongside them were more than 25,000 postcards from members of the Club for the Future, which is a special group that Blue Origin created to inspire future generations. There was also a test dummy named Mannequin Skywalker <laughs> on the flight to collect data. Once the dinosaur bones came back from their trip to space, they were put on display. Each of them was carefully placed and shown to people who are part of the Club for the Future, as well as in museums all around the country. But you know what's even more surprising? This wasn't the first time dinosaur bones went into space. In the past, NASA astronauts also took fossils on their mission. Back in 1985, a piece of a baby dinosaur's vertebrae and an eggshell flew on NASA's space shuttle Challenger. And in 1998, a 210-million-year-old skull went on to space on another shuttle called Endeavour. They must have had quite an adventure up there. I don't know, do fossils have fun anymore? Oh, and don't forget about the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yep, even parts of a T-Rex were sent into space in 2014 on NASA's Orion spacecraft. I bet those bones were really big and scary looking. But, surprisingly, this is not the only strange thing we've sent into space. In fact, a lot of our weird stuff has been there. For example, back in 2018, Elon Musk, the guy behind SpaceX and Tesla, did something totally wild. He sent his own shiny red Tesla Roadster into space. But that's not all. Inside the car, there was a dummy dressed in a spacesuit, and they named him Starman. How cool is that? Originally, the plan was to put the car in orbit around Mars, but something unexpected happened. The car went way past Mars and got stuck going around the sun instead. Can you imagine driving a car around the sun? It takes almost 560 days for the car to complete one lap. It's almost a two-year-long trip. As of June 2023, they have completed more than three and a half orbits around the sun and have traveled over two and a half billion miles. That's like going around the Earth over 100,000 times. The car has definitely gone above and beyond its normal driving limits. What's that they say about your mileage may vary? Unfortunately, Starman doesn't send us any new pictures anymore. It's been a while since we heard from him. Scientists think that both the car and the dummy passenger may have suffered some damage during their cosmic adventure. But, oh well, it was inevitable. It's space, after all. Now, another strange thing that will be launched into space is the president's hair. Yep, you heard that right. On President's Day 2023, a company called Celestis made an unusual announcement. They're going to send some famous president's hair into outer space. Hair samples from George Washington, John Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, and Ronald Reagan were carefully collected and verified. This precious presidential hair will then be placed on the Enterprise spacecraft, which is going to launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida, sometime in the summer of 2023. But wait, that's not all. The spacecraft won't just carry president's hair. It will also have remains of other important people. One of them will be Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. Some of his ashes were sent into space before, back in 1997, on Celeste's first flight. Well, I guess some of his remains still remain for a second trip. Now, here's the best part. The Enterprise spacecraft will not stay close to Earth. Oh no! It'll have a grander destination. It's set to travel beyond the farthest reaches of our solar system. 
It's going on an incredible journey into the unknown, from hair to eternity. Prices starting at $12,500 and up. But it's not as cool as a space party. Back in January 2018, something totally funky happened. Rocket Lab, an aerospace company, secretly sent a giant disco ball into space. They named it the Humanity Star, and boy, was it a sight to see. This massive mirror was about 3 feet wide and covered in 65 shiny panels. It spun rapidly as it orbited around our beautiful planet, reflecting sunlight back to Earth. It was so bright that you could even spot it without a telescope. The Humanity Star was like a dazzling reminder of how delicate and special our place in the universe is. But here's the sad part. The disco ball's time in space was short-lived. It came back down to Earth's atmosphere on March 22nd, just two months after it launched. That was way earlier than expected. Guess the party had to end sooner than they thought. Now here's a fun fact. Just like with dinosaurs, the Humanity Star wasn't the first disco ball to make its way into space. Starshine Project launched three similar shiny objects between 1999 and 2001. One of those groovy satellites, Starshine 3, stayed up in space for over a year. And let's not forget about Japan's mirror-covered satellite called Ajisei, launched in 1986, which is still up there orbiting Earth today. Humans sure love to send disco balls into space, huh? Well, scientists also have a sense of humor. So, prepare for some interstellar monkey business. Sometimes astronauts like to dress up as animals while in space. Back in 2016, an astronaut named Mark Kelly had a hilarious plan. He smuggled a full-body gorilla suit to his twin brother Scott, who was staying on the International Space Station. Can you imagine a gorilla floating around in space? Well, it happened. There's even a video that went viral. Scott surprised another astronaut, Tim Peake, from the United Kingdom by chasing him through the different modules of the ISS while wearing the gorilla suit. And here's the twist. Tim Peake was actually in on the joke, so it was all a good-natured prank. Now here's a funny backstory. Mark Kelly had actually tried to send the gorilla suit to Scott in 2015. He hit it on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, but sadly, the rocket went up in flames shortly after liftoff. Talk about bad luck for a gorilla suit. But do you know what item had better luck? The famous lightsaber from Star Wars, wielded by none other than Luke Skywalker himself. In 2007, a team of astronauts had a special mission. Alongside assembling the Harmony module on the International Space Station, they brought along Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. It was a tribute to the iconic movie series that inspired so many space lovers. The launch coincided with the 30th anniversary of the first Star Wars film, A New Hope. Fun fact, this lightsaber was Luke's second one, a cool green laser sword from Return of the Jedi. So these are the weirdest things we've sent into space. Next time you gaze up at the night sky, remember it's not just planets and stars out there. It's a cosmic playground filled with strange and wonderful objects from our very own Earth. And who knows what peculiar items we'll venture into space next. Hundreds of dinosaur species roamed our planet, and researchers give a name to a new type approximately every two weeks. It's not fair to stick to T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Spinosaurus, and other famous sauruses all the time. They've had their chance to shine in the movies and across the internet. So let's check out dinosaurs that no one talks about. First on our list is Taurosaurus. The special thing about this dinosaur is that it definitely had one of the largest skulls ever found. It was big because of this frill going from the back of the animal's skull and covering its neck. The frill wasn't there for protection. It was probably just to show off a bit. The bone in the frill was thin and full of holes. As you can see, it's very similar to Triceratops. There are still debates about whether these two are the same species. But more and more studies show that they were more like cousins. They were probably similar in size, but Taurosaurus had a longer head with big openings, as well as longer frill bones with a groove on top. It also had more pairs of horns on the back of the frill. Some like to call Taurosaurus a bull lizard. These fellows were plant-eaters that may have lived in social groups. 
They existed at approximately the same age, but Taurosaurus somehow ended up on the less popular side of the family. Kentrosaurus was a small stegosaurus. It's one of the least cuddly dinosaurs of all time. Its long, thin spikes seemed to be a pretty good defense mechanism. Stegosaurus, on the other hand, had shorter, thicker spikes that were less likely to bend or snap when the animal used them. Now, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near Kentrosaurus, though. Its tail could swing in a big half-circle and hit with a force strong enough to break a human skull. Any volunteers? No? Okay. One scientist used scans of the dino's fossils to make a computer model of its skeleton. The model showed that Kentrosaurus had a flexible neck. It must have been really useful for looking around to see if something interesting was going on or if there was any dangerous animals trying to sneak up. Kentrosaurus typically walked on all four legs with straight hind limbs. The computer model tells us it could spread its front legs out to its sides, too. Maybe it was a way to protect its belly during fights. Stegosauruses, in general, had tails that were like big weights at the back of their bodies. That's why their balance point was closer to their hips. It's also the reason why they could easily stand on their hind legs and swing their tails around. So most people haven't heard of heterodontosaurs, even though their fossils show that dinosaurs got feathers way back before we thought and in groups where we didn't expect it. In 2008, paleontologists identified the first known skull of a baby heterodontosaurus, which was less than 2 inches long, smaller than a tea bag. This baby dinosaur had relatively big eyes and a short snout compared to bigger ones of its kind. Now, what's really interesting is that some scientists used to think that heterodontosaurus' tusks, like those of modern warthogs, only appeared when they were fully grown. But it seems they had them from the early stages of their life. Heterodontosaurus had five fingers on each hand, two of which were opposable. It was a good tool, considering the animal probably ate both plants and meat. Humans have different types of teeth, some for biting, some for chewing, and also canines. But most reptiles have just one kind of teeth. Hedrodontosaurus was special because it had three different types of teeth. Small peg-like ones, big teeth resembling canines, and square-shaped teeth that did the cutting job. Scientists are not entirely sure how this creature used these different types of teeth. Maybe it was for digging up roots, breaking into termite nests, or even defending themselves against dangerous animals. Okay, say this name with me now. Sidacosaurus. She was quite a common dinosaur in its time, but she never still gained popularity. Scientists found out that when these dinosaurs were young, they probably crawled, considering they had longer arms and short legs. But as they got older, between 4 and 6 years old, their hind legs started growing much faster and became much longer than their front legs. So, later in life, they likely didn't move on all fours anymore, but walked on two legs. Inside the stomach of one of these creatures, scientists found pebbles. This shows the animals either had a hard time digesting what it ate, or it didn't chew its food very well. Its beak looks quite familiar. That's how it got its specific name, a parrot lizard. It was really strong, and some believe the creature used it to crack and open tough nuts and seeds before the pebbles in its stomach helped mash them up for digestion. These guys might have been good at swimming. They had broad feet, and the shape of their tail could have helped them move in the water relatively easily. Some scientists even believe they might have spent most of their lives swimming in rivers and lakes. In 2004, researchers found something really sweet. 24 young parrot lizards huddled together. They were too big to be hatchlings, so it could be a bunch of teenagers who had left their nests and then formed a group where they could support one another and defend themselves better. But apparently, that plan didn't work out so well. Now, check this one out, Stygemolog, or as they call it, Styx Demon. We're looking at a peaceful, plant-eating creature with bony spikes and knobs on its skull. 
Most scientists believe it was a younger form of this fellow, even though they used to think they were a separate species. Stygimoloch is smaller than its more popular cousin, but it's also more robust and has a pretty thick neck. This dinosaur, with small forelimbs and long hind legs 3 feet high, which is half as high as an average human. That doesn't sound dangerous in the world of giant and fierce dinosaurs, but the animal had a very thick skull roof. Maybe it wasn't the strongest tool to defend itself, but it probably helped in combat with rivals from its own species. They most likely headbutted to win the hearts of their chosen ones. But rivals from its own herd were a piece of cake compared to the predators that might have gone after it. After all, this dino lived at the same time as old T-Rex. Now, when someone tells you to picture a dinosaur, Chisosaurus would probably be the last thing coming to your mind. It looks as if you've put together pieces of random animals and tried to make your friends believe this truly was a real animal that once roamed the Earth. But it's actually a dino, with giant sharp claws on its forelimbs, a bulky body, and a long neck ending with a tiny head. Now, don't let the claws scare you, though. These creatures didn't go after other animals since they were herbivores. But these claws could protect the animal from intruders and predators. The full scientific name of this creature describes it as a giant sloth-like reptile from China. This animal was one of the biggest and oldest members of the group where it belonged, which lived around 115 million years ago. No, I wasn't around then. At first, it was hard to tell which animals were related to this weird-looking dinosaur. But in the 1990s, scientists made a conclusion that they were modified plant-eating theropods, which is similar to carnivorous dinos. They also most likely had feathers and small wings, like some sort of a very big turkey. <laughs> the problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. But it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today, but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then, these particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks, it fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived, or even better. The rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then, the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then, new players enter the field. Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster, 
Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with Diplodocuses or Brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as Ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with Parasaurolophuses. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller, harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kind of cute. People ride horses, camels, Parasaurolophysis and Pachycephalosauruses. Of course, many have tried to tame velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost the same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosauruses would have survived, but in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. 
Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA. And it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? We've all been afraid of the dark at some point in our lives, haven't we? I mean, do you remember getting tucked into bed by your mom or dad after they read you some scary fairy tale with monsters and dragons or even dinosaurs? But just as your parents were about to turn the lights off and silently step out of your room, you remembered. What if there was something hiding under your bed? Or worse, what if some spooky creature was stuck somewhere in the closet? You could probably get up and check, but it was too dark out there. Wouldn't it be great to have some source of light that would come from within your body? You could always use it whenever you get surrounded by darkness. Unfortunately, as humans, we aren't able to do that. But there are a bunch of creatures out there that can, in fact, light themselves up. That's thanks to a little something scientists call bioluminescence. Animals and fish living in the ocean tend to have this talent more often than others. And you can find these creatures anywhere close to the surface or deep down at the bottom. 2.5 miles deep if you have a knack for numbers. These creatures use their light for a lot of things, like communicating with other members of their species, luring in prey, and even scaring away enemies. Bioluminescence is basically an organism's ability to emit its own light. Chemistry has a lot to do with it. Such animals use two chemicals, one called luciferin, and the other called luciferase. Add a bit of oxygen and BAM! Light! Should you ever wonder if you actually observe bioluminescence or if someone just dropped a glow stick in the ocean, be on the lookout for neon blue, green, or even red sparkles in the sea. They're usually spread over a large area. This can even make the water look like glitter or a starry sky. You can thank squid, tiny crustaceans, and algae for this romantic atmosphere. Now, I've got another unusual phenomenon for you. How about a golden waterfall? I'm not kidding, it actually exists, and it's a natural phenomenon. To see it, you have to drive to Yosemite National Park to the Horsetail Fall. Make sure to plan your trip in winter or early spring. That's the only time during the year when you can see this awesome phenomenon. It doesn't need any scientific explanation. It's nothing more than sunlight at dusk hitting the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava. Or gold, your choice. That's the reason why during this time of year, the Horsetail Fall is also named the Firefall. Unfortunately, this phenomenon is becoming less and less visible within the years, mostly because of drought and other issues connecting with the melting of snow. So, should you ever decide to visit, Keep an eye on the waterfall, since the effect is very brief. Ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? It's also called volcanic lightning. Apparently, specialists looking into the phenomenon have yet to fully grasp what it is. When a regular thunderstorm happens, particles with positive and negative charges collide, hence the giant spark we call lightning. It also makes a lot of noise, which you can recognize as thunder. 
But when a volcano is erupting, some of the volcanic ash particles get electrically charged, and while getting projected into the air with a huge force, they collide and cause electrical discharges. This whole process makes it look like there's lightning coming from the volcano itself. Imagine all that ash, gas, and smoke coming from the crater, and then add some electricity to the mix. It'll make the whole picture look really bizarre. No wonder this phenomenon is called the dirty thunderstorm. Now, how about clouds that look like waves? Those are called Asparitas clouds, and they're actually quite close to the ground, unlike your regular day-to-day -day clouds. The name comes from the word aspero, which in Latin translates to rough or uneven. On rare occasion, you may spot such clouds when the weather is calm, but they're mostly associated with thunderstorms. These clouds appear during unstable atmospheric conditions, and surprisingly, they don't produce rain. Even though they do resemble dark storm-like clouds, they also create random patterns, tricking your eyes into thinking you're looking at the surface of the sea from under the water. Another impressive kind of cloud is called Mamatis clouds. What makes them so special is a series of bulges emerging from the base of each cloud. One such cloud enters a level in the atmosphere where the wind direction changes. You can see these wave-like patterns in the sky. Australia is the place for you if you like surfing, but not all the waves you can catch there are made of water. Near a town called Hayden, there's a mysterious wave made out of rocks. This granite formation supposedly dates back to 2.63 billion years ago. That's way before dinosaurs started hanging around the planet. Standing at 49 feet high and 360 feet long, the wave was formed as a result of two processes, weathering and erosion. There's softer sediment at the base of the wave rock, which was chemically weathered by groundwater. Winds and rain did the rest of the job, causing the erosion of the rest of the formation. Its red, yellow, and gray stripes are made of iron hydroxide, carbonates, and other chemical compounds that were washed down by the rain. You've made it to Australia, so stick around a bit more. There's one more location here that seems unreal. You'll need to fly over this one, however, if you want the best picture. In the western part of the country, surrounded by green woodlands, there's a series of lakes. They're all a staggering shade of bright pink. Out of them all, the most famous is Lake Hillier, a 2,000-foot-long reservoir. It's surrounded by both sand and a forest of eucalyptus trees. This makes the cartoon-like hue of the lake stand out even more. One of the many theories explaining the color of these mysterious lakes is connected with algae. These algae appear to gather high levels of a substance called beta-carotene, which has a red-orange pigment in it. Another explanation involves haloarchaea. Those are microorganisms that sometimes look red. Even if you don't enjoy flying, the lakes are great for taking a swim. They're not toxic, even though they have loads of salt in them. This means you'll be able to stay afloat easily, and the water won't damage your swimsuit. During winter up north in Canada, a bizarre phenomenon happens at Lake Abraham in Alberta. Underneath the frozen surface, you can spot some weird objects that look like frozen jellyfish. It's definitely not the case, as these creepy formations are just frozen methane bubbles. Those are pockets of gas that were trapped underwater and got stuck there after the lake had frozen. They appear when leaves and grass fall into the water and bacteria digest them. This process transforms them into methane. This phenomenon is as beautiful and strange as it is dangerous. The pockets of methane can easily become highly flammable. When the temperatures rise during the spring, the ice melts and these bubbles start popping and fizzing. It's a spectacular sight to observe. Picture a lake filled with soda. Remember not to bring any source of fire. It can be very dangerous for visitors. You can check out these types of lakes all across Canada's Banff National Park. Nature often tends to make its own music. Just listen to the sound of crickets at night or the soothing noise of a waterfall.
But in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there's a strange geological phenomenon which takes nature soundtracks to a completely different level. These are called the ringing rocks, and scientists still can't explain their unusual behavior. If you strike these rocks with a heavy object, like a hammer or another rock, the stones will make a ringing sound, as if they were hollow, but they're not. What makes the ringing rocks even more bizarre, apart from the mysterious sound they make, is that no animal wants to hang around there. Even though the rocks are surrounded by a thick forest, scientists haven't managed to trace any animal activity in the area yet. Even more striking is the fact that despite all the trees around the rocks, you won't find any leaves lying on the boulders. What makes these rocks so unappealing for both animals and vegetation is still up for debate. 66 million years ago, I wasn't around then, a huge asteroid hit the Earth and triggered the mass extinction of almost all living creatures on the planet, including dinosaurs. Had the space object crashed somewhere else, some dinosaurs would have been able to survive and still live nowadays. According to some research, the asteroid had about 1 in 10 chances of wiping out the dinosaurs and other animals of that time. It was way more likely to just hit the ground without any strong destructive consequences. To understand how things could have turned out if the place of the collision had occurred elsewhere, we need to find out what happened that day and why the disaster turned out to be so devastating. This huge space rock fell into the coastal area of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. This caused a chain reaction that triggered natural disasters around the world. The place the asteroid hit is called Chicxulub Crater. Now half of this area is underwater. The asteroid was about 7.5 miles in diameter and moving at a speed of 27,000 miles per hour. This rock, bigger than Everest, was rushing toward Earth faster than the speed of sound by almost 40 times. Wow! The energy released in the collision was as powerful as an explosion of about 10 billion atomic bombs. And the destructive force of the blast wave was just one of several disasters. The asteroid happened to fall in one of the worst possible places. And because of the way it fell, it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. Imagine you're jumping into the water like a professional athlete, vertically, leaving hardly any splashes behind. And now think of how much water splashes when you jump into the pool like a cannonball. So the asteroid landed the cannonball way. The second disaster the asteroid provoked was soot burning. A small part of the Earth's surface consists of rocks. Only a tiny percentage of that part was rich in oil and sulfur back then. The asteroid burned and lifted so much soot into the air that it would be enough to fill an indoor baseball stadium. According to research, 65 million years ago, only 13% of the surface of the entire planet could have contained the necessary amount of organic material for the formation of such a volume of soot. That's why this place was considered the worst. If the catastrophe had happened on the territory of the other 87%, then dinosaurs would have been alive today. A huge cloud of soot and carbon dioxide rose into the air and covered the sun. The soot turned the sky gray and partially blocked sunlight. This led to a quick drop in temperatures almost all over the planet. It seemed like Earth was inside a gray veil. Many plants and animals couldn't survive the cold snap. Trees began to wither because of the lack of sun. The photosynthesis process was disrupted. The cold and withering of trees led to another catastrophe – global famine. Herbivores couldn't survive because they lost almost all of their food. Plants, flowers, and trees didn't manage to get through the catastrophe. These destructions spread far beyond the asteroid impact site. Hot dust particles, asteroid chunks, and small pieces of rocks settled to the ground across the continent and caused large-scale forest fires. Burning trees threw even more soot into the air, which made the situation even worse. The huge asteroid brought heavy metals with an increased level of toxicity from space. The melting of these substances during the collision provoked firestorms. The asteroid didn't only hit continental land, but also water, which triggered a huge tsunami. But that's not the worst part. The seabed was filled with sulfate, and when the energy of the asteroid burned it, 
it provoked the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The acid cloud mixed with a cloud of soot and began to spread throughout the sky. Hot rock particles were falling to the ground like fire rain. An acid rain started because of sulfur. It lasted for almost several days and left no chance for the animals to survive. Acid rain made the water in rivers, lakes, and seas poison. The acid destroyed anything that couldn't burn. A part of the clouds went to wreck the land, and the other part, the ocean. This made the situation even worse, as sulfur droplets wiped out a huge amount of seaweed and phytoplankton. The ocean generates almost half of all oxygen reserves on our planet. Those days, the sea creatures living in its upper parts were destroyed. It wasn't the blast wave, but lack of sun, acid, darkness, and cold that became the main reasons for the extinction of dinosaurs. But even when some lizards escaped from fires and sulfur, they met the sea element. The asteroid impact caused large-scale tsunamis across the planet. The very first wave was around one mile in height. That's almost three times higher than the Empire State Building. Billions of gallons of water were moving at 90 miles per hour. A wave this strong could easily destroy half of New York today. The meteorite created a series of waves 52 feet high. Massive walls of water the size of five-story buildings collapsed on the shore and demolished everything in their path. Lack of sunlight, temperature drop, acid and fire rains, reduced oxygen production, forest fires, giant tsunamis, and the explosive wave with the power of a billion atomic bombs all this reduced the biological diversity of Earth by 75%. Yeah, that'll change your climate for sure. Giant asteroids used to hit Earth before, but they never caused such disasters all over the planet. What if this asteroid had fallen into another place, say a forest, far from water and mountainous terrain? This would have caused severe fires. A huge black cloud of ash would have risen into the sky and obscured the sun. But it would have unlikely generated acid or fire rains. Most of the species of the planet could have survived this catastrophe. What if the meteorite had fallen somewhere among the ice and snow? This would have provoked a rapid increase in temperature across the planet. Huge tsunamis would have sunk big tracts of land. However, ash and sulfur dioxide wouldn't have filled the sky. Acid rain wouldn't have hit the ocean. Many marine creatures could have survived and lived to this day. And dinosaurs, far from the oceans, wouldn't have noticed the meteorite fall at all. Probably the most terrible events would have occurred if a meteorite had fallen on an active volcano. This would have triggered the largest lava release in history. Destructive earthquakes would have begun, and the whole sky would have been covered with volcanic ash. What if the meteorite had hit some desert? It would have melted billions of tons of sand and turned it into glass. Just imagine glass dunes that heat our planet even more. And we could dig up the well-preserved remains of ancient lizards out of the glass. Anyway, there were many different possible catastrophic scenarios. And the worst of them came true for the dinosaurs. They are unlikely to return. Although, perhaps, they can be reborn. Scientists were inspired by an idea from a famous Hollywood movie. They wanted to find a mosquito that got stuck in amber. They would extract dinosaur DNA from it. But there was a problem with this. The oldest DNA sample they managed to find was 1 million years old. Dinosaurs were extinct about 66 million years ago. Besides, DNA is a very fragile thing. The probability that it could have been preserved intact somewhere for so long is very small. So, instead of searching for this ancient dinosaur DNA, scientists decided to take DNA from the closest ancestors of these lizards, birds. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaur paws could have turned into wings, and elongated mouths could have become beaks. Pelicans are very similar to pterodactyls, ostriches resemble velociraptors, and chickens are very much like T-Rex. Okay, let's just stop and imagine for a moment a chicken the size of a T-Rex. Hey, you! You want a piece of me? Now, the common chicken is recognized as the closest relative of the huge lizard. Remove the plumage from it, cover it with scales, give a toothy mouth instead of a beak, and attach a long tail. And you get a real, mini Tyrannosaurus rex by body structure and movement. Deep in its DNA, there are similar genes that formidable predators have. With the help of genetic engineering, 
scientists plan to play with its DNA and try to reverse the evolution, which means breeding dinosaurs can become a reality. Well, that could come back to bite you.